Uh, so I broke the talk today into uh, three parts. Um, the first will remind you about the history of ALK and ROS1 and how those are clinically validated uh, molecular targets in lung and other cancers. Um, I talked a lot about this last year, so I won't go into too much detail about that. In the second part of the talk, we'll review some of the mechanisms of resistance to crizotinib specifically. And again, you've heard about some of these, so we'll kind of just generally talk about the ones um, that we and other groups have identified um, primarily from patient samples. And then finally, we'll end on some of the new strategies to overcome crizotinib resistance. Many of these focus on next generation TKI monotherapy. We've just heard some of the limitations of doing that. Nevertheless, these are showing really remarkable activity in our patients, and these are drugs that you're going to see on the market fairly soon. So just to remind you about um, what we know about the oncogenic drivers in non-small cell lung cancer, this is the pie chart summarizing the frequency of these oncogenic drivers in uh, lung adenocarcinomas. We've heard about the EGFR subset of patients, which really is uh, the largest targetable subset of patients. In this country, we see EGFR mutations in about 10 to 15 percent of patients. But what we'll talk, be talking about are the ALK and ROS1 patients, and those define a smaller uh, groups of patients. ALK is found in about 3 to 5 percent of our patients, um, and ROS1 is distinctly less common even than ALK, found in only about 1 percent of our patients. But as Leisha mentioned, there are so many patients with lung cancer uh, in this country and, and globally that even these small percentages really do add up to a large number of patients. I did want to remind you that these uh, targetable subsets, ALK and ROS1, are associated with uh, characteristic uh, clinical and pathologic features. These patients tend to be younger um, by about 10 to 15 years. They tend to be never in, or light smokers. And by, a by and large, most of them do have adenocarcinoma histology. So ALK rearrangements were actually first discovered in anaplastic uh, large cell lymphoma almost 20 years ago, and then were, were more recently discovered as an oncogenic driver in non-small cell lung cancer in 2007, so just about six years ago by Dr. Mano's team in Japan. Um, and in addition to uh, lymphoma and non-small cell lung cancer, ALK is also believed to be a driver in other tumor types, particularly inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which is a rare type of soft tissue sarcoma, as well as a smattering of other solid tumor types. To date, over 27 uh, different fusion, ALK fusion variants have been reported just in lung cancer alone, and these are schematized here. And in all of these cases, you can see that the ALK fusions contain the entire intracellular tyrosine kinase domain of ALK fused to any of a number of different five prime partner proteins, and it can be different portions of those five prime proteins as well. So the most common one is EML4. There's also KIF5B, KLC1, as well as TFG. And in all of these cases, by uh, fusing the tyrosine kinase domain of ALK to these partner proteins, you now lead to aberrant expression as well as constitutive activation of the ALK tyrosine kinase, and this is what drives transformation of the cells. Now similarly, ROS1 can be involved in chromosomal rearrangements just like ALK. Um, ROS1 was discovered also in a different tumor type initially in GBMs, but again was kind of rediscovered in non-small cell lung cancer also in 2007 by the group um, in Beverly Cell Signaling Technology. So again, ROS1 is a target not just in lung cancers, but also in a number of other tumor types. And shown here are the different ROS1 fusions that have been reported in non-small cell lung cancer. Again, the same theme where you have the tyrosine kinase domain of ROS1 fused to different parts of different partner proteins like SDC4 or CD74. And this then leads to constitutive activation of the ROS1 tyrosine kinase. I did want to point out, um, and you probably inferred this from the pie chart, that these oncogenic drivers are generally mutually exclusive, so patients either have one or the other. We almost, we have actually never seen overlap of ALK and ROS1 rearrangements. So ALK and ROS1 actually turn out to be very interesting because um, they both encode uh, re receptor tyrosine kinases, and actually they're very closely related. And this is a phylogenetic tree of the human tyrosine kinases to point out how closely related these two tyrosine kinases are. They're also related to leukocyte tyrosine kinase, and they're in, uh, related to the insulin receptors um, family of tyrosine kinases. And so perhaps not surprisingly, given that close relationship, the tyrosine kinase domains of ALK and ROS1 are very, very similar. So in the ATP binding sites of these two tyrosine kinases, there's 77% amino acid identity, which you can see here. 
And this is an overlay of the three-dimensional structures of ALK and ROS1 as predicted by computational modeling, showing that these tyrosine kinase domains really are very, very similar um, and actually bind to crizotinib, um, which we'll talk about in a second, in an almost identical manner. So perhaps it's no surprise that crizotinib, as well as many of the other ALK inhibitors, actually also inhibit ROS1 as well. So crizotinib, and we've talked about this, I think, at, at almost every t meeting that I've been here um, for this uh, group. To remind you, crizotinib was actually originally developed to target a different tyrosine kinase, that being CMET, um, and it is a very, very potent CMET inhibitor. And in the course of characterizing the selectivity profile of crizotinib, it was found that crizotinib also inhibits a number of other tyrosine kinases, as shown here. So it was known very early on that crizotinib does inhibit ALK quite effectively. Later on, it was found that ALK does inhibit ROS1. And then you can see a handful of other tyrosine kinases that are quite potently inhibited by crizotinib, such as RON and Axel. However, given that it was actually somewhat coincidental timing of the development of crizotinib, um, it was in a phase one trial, moving along very smoothly in dose escalation when Dr. Mano made that critical discovery of ALK rearrangements in lung cancer um, that same, around the exact same time so that patients were able to be identified as uh, having an ALK rearrangement and then almost immediately enrolled onto a clinical trial of an ALK targeted therapy. So it was very um, uh, fortuitous timing. So I don't want to summarize all the clinical data on crizotinib and ALK-positive lung cancer because we've talked about that before, but this is just to highlight the most recent data from the phase three publication of crizotinib. Um, it was published a few months ago in the New England Journal. This is a waterfall plot of patients um, with uh, advanced ALK-positive lung cancer who had previously failed one line of chemotherapy, and half of those patients were randomized to receive crizotinib. And this is the activity of crizotinib in those patients showing a very high response rate, again, recapitulating the data from the phase one one and two studies, where most patients do have some response to crizotinib. The response rate here was about 65%, as shown by the, all the red downward bars. And I just wanted to compare that to what we saw with the standard chemotherapy arm. So half the patients also, also received standard single-agent chemotherapy, either pemetrexid or docetaxel. Pemetrexid is our most active uh, chemotherapy in adenocarcinoma, so I just wanted to highlight to you the response rate with Pemetrexid, where it was actually quite respectable at about 20%, although that's compared to 65% with crizotinib. And I think, uh, more tellingly, the, uh, the durations of these responses were, of course, shorter with chemotherapy compared to crizotinib. So here, the median PFS with crizotinib was close to eight months, whereas the median PFS with our most active chemotherapy, pemetrexid, was only about four months, so about double the time. So I did summarize all this data last year, but the point of this was that the phase three study confirmed what we knew about the high activity of crizotinib in ALK-positive lung cancer. It's clearly more active than chemotherapy in terms of response rate and progression-free survival. It has better uh, toxicity profile, and it also has significantly improved patient-reported outcomes like quality of life. And this study really led to the full approval of crizotinib in this country, as well as global approval of crizotinib around the world. So what about ROS1? Well, ROS1 appears to be uh, equally um, inhibited by crizotinib and to be a very, very good target of crizotinib. This is the most recent update of the phase one study, the ROS1 expansion cohort. So enrolling patients with advanced ROS1 rearranged lung cancer, all the patients are receiving crizotinib at the standard dose. And you can see that here, just like what we saw with ALK in the early days, almost all ROS1 patients are responsive to crizotinib. The response rate is also about 60%, but almost all patients do experience some tumor shrinkage. So again, a very, very good target for crizotinib. Here's just to remind you about these responses, and we've seen these already uh, through Alicia and Jeff's talk. This is a patient of mine with ROS1 positive lung cancer, one of the earliest patients to go on to crizotinib, who had very extensive disease in the chest at baseline and had one of these miraculous responses. And actually, he remains on crizotinib now a little over two and a half years with a complete response. So again, these ROS1 positive cancers, I would say, are as sensitive, if not even a little more sensitive, than ALK positive cancers to crizotinib. So as we've seen and heard a lot about from Jeff, um, the issue with crizotinib as well as our other targeted therapies, therapies is even though they do work very well, we are limited by the development of resistance. This is one of our long-term patients who had one of these nice responses, on a near complete response to crizotinib. And then unfortunately at about three years, she became resistant to crizotinib. And you can see that the, her tumors basically regrew in almost all the same places in her chest. <clears throat> 
The other type of resistance that I wanted to mention um, is, is more probably a pharmacokinetic issue with uh, crizotinib, and this has to do with the, ch the fact that many of our patients, when they relapse on crizotinib, they actually relapse in the brain. So probably about in 50% of cases, the first site of relapse actually is the CNS. And so this is a very big problem for our patients, our ALK positive, and I should say ROS1 positive patients as well, is that their, uh, their brain represents a sanctuary site for disease. So this is a patient actually of Leisha's who had, uh, was ALK positive and had uh, started on crizotinib and done very, very well. Um, she had no brain um, metastases at baseline, but at nine months she developed some symptoms like headache, and Leisha obtained brain imaging, and now she had innumerable brain mets. And this, is, unfortunately, is a very, very common scenario. Now, it's known that crizotinib is a substrate of P glycoprotein, or MDR1, and it's believed that uh, efflux via this pump may actually be responsible for limiting the levels of crizotinib in the CNS, and hence accounting for um, this sanctuary site for patients with ALK and ROS1 positive lung cancer. So we'll talk about um, this later in the context of next generation inhibitors. So as Jeff mentioned, there are many different ways we can study resistance, and of course all of this work has been done in collaboration with Jeff's lab. And really what I wanted to highlight um, briefly for the next um, part of this talk is some of the, what we've learned about resistance by studying patient samples directly, from biopsying their resistant tumors and also generating cell lines from those resistant tumors. So um, the first ALK resistance mutation was actually uh, reported right at the same time as when Dr. Uh, Eunice Kwok presented the phase one data on crizotinib in ALK positive lung cancer. And again, Dr. Mano's group actually had a patient, a young patient who had responded very well to crizotinib and then relapsed after about seven months. And they had actually gone ahead to rebiopsy this patient and actually had found two separate ALK resistance mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain. And I just wanted to highlight this one, the L1196M gatekeeper mutation. This is analogous to the EGFR T790M mutation, and it turns out to be the most common ALK resistance mutation that we see in the clinic. And uh, as shown here by this modeling, the 1196M mutation does lead to steric interference with crizotinib binding, and this is believed to mediate uh, resistance to crizotinib. As it turns out, there actually are a number of different ALK resistance mutations, so this is very different than what we see with EGFR. Um, so we've seen at least, um, I think about eight or nine different ALK resistance mutations. These are all in the tyrosine kinase domain, as shown here. This is from a recent review in Nature Reviews Cancer by Hallberg and Palmer. It nicely illustrates the location of these different resistance mutations, and, and probably many of them do actually function like the gatekeeper mutation in causing steric interference with crizotinib binding, although there may be other mechanisms of resistance as well. 1196M is the gatekeeper, the most common, but you can see there are these other mutations, and one that we'll talk a lot more about is G1202R, um, which is a very highly resistant mutation. In, in ALK. So we also know a little bit now about resistance in ROS1 rearranged lung cancer, um, and not that much because as you saw, the data on ROS1 is still very early. Um, but this is a patient of ours here um, who was uh, ROS1 positive and had a very uh, dramatic response to crizotinib when she started, but unfortunately she had rapid progression after only about 10 to 12 weeks of treatment. And Mark Awad, one of our fellows, did a very nice study now trying to define her mechanism of resistance. And he found that she actually had acquired a new ROS1 mutation. This is 2032R, which is analogous to that 1202R mutation I just mentioned, which is probably the most highly resistant mutation in ALK and possibly in ROS1 as well. And as you can see here, again, by this modeling, and this was done in collaboration with Pfizer, that this mutation clearly does cause steric interference with crizotinib binding. So as uh, Jeff and Lisha both pointed out, there are actually other mechanisms of resistance besides alteration of the tyrosine kinase itself. And so I just wanted to highlight one of these. There actually are many different potential bypass tracks that can mediate resistance to crizotinib, and one of them happens to be EGFR. Um, there have been a lot of cell line studies that um, Ryohei Kadiyama in Jeff's lab performed to show that EGFR can mediate resistance to crizotinib, and we went ahead and validated that in patients as well. These are two of our patients who uh, had paired biopsy samples, so they had a biopsy done prior to crizotinib as well as a biopsy done after they became resistant to crizotinib, showing that these patients had increased EGFR based on phospho-EGFR immunohistochemistry. Um, and we saw this in the paired samples that we ha saw. We saw increased EGFR in roughly um, almost half of those patients. So EGFR may be a, an important bypass mechanism. 
And exactly how EGFR is activated, we're not sure. We have not seen um, acquisition of EGFR activating mutations or EGFR amplification that could explain activation of EGFR. We do see upregulation of the EGF receptor, um, as well as upregulation of some of the EGF ligands like amphiregulin. So in the next three slides, I wanted to highlight three um, clinical vignettes, actually, that highlight um, some of the concepts that you've already heard about from Leisha and Jeff, um, but I think are very important emerging concepts on uh, acquired resistance. So this is a patient that I just mentioned um, who had ROS1 positive lung cancer and became rapidly resistant to crizotinib. And as I mentioned, uh, Mark Awad found this very resistant mutation, G2032R. This patient actually, when she passed away, um, was very interested in, in helping um, our effort to understand resistance and actually did, um, her family did request an autopsy, which we performed, and so we were actually able to sample all of her me uh, metastatic sites of disease, which is a very um, unique thing to be able to do. And so you can see here, we've indicated all the different places where, where Mark, um, in collaboration with our pathology collaborators, um, sampled, and you can see that, interestingly, at every site of metastasis, he identified the same resistance mutation. And so this suggests that this mutation really was um, potentially a very early event, um, and that led to the rapid progression of disease in this patient. So this is a little bit different than what we've been talking about. We've been talking a lot about the heterogeneity. And interestingly, this patient was almost the opposite. She had a very homogeneous resistance mechanism that really showed up at all sites of metastatic disease. Now the second case I think is more um, typical of what we see, which has to do with the heterogeneity. And this slide really is meant to sort of highlight the, uh, how important the selective pressure um, that's placed on these tumor cells by the TKI can be in shaping the evolution of resistance. So this is a patient of mine who uh, was a young patient who was ALK positive and had had about a two-year response to crizotinib and then relapsed, and he had a malignant pleural effusion at the time of relapse. So we tapped that pleural effusion, and we characterized the different resistance mutations in this patient's tumor specimen, and you can see we actually found a number of different resistance mutations, um, but the most common one was actually G1269A, which is a, definitely confers crizotinib resistance, and less frequently we found other uh, resistance mutations like the 1151T and G1202. Now, when this patient's tumor cells were cultured with crizotinib, you can see we actually selected out pretty much just the tumor cells with that crizotinib resistance mutation, G1269A. But interestingly, this patient actually went on to receive LDK378 on the phase one trial, and after about a week of treatment, we again tapped his malignant pleural effusion, cultured out the tumor cells, and now cultured those in LDK378. And now you can see we actually shifted the tumor cells. So now we actually have shifted it to a more highly resistant mutation G1202R. So I think, again, this is really shows us that these tumor populations are heterogeneous and that we can actually change um, the types of resistance mechanisms we see based on the therapies that we're using. The third case I want to highlight is a patient actually that um, Dr. Chapner knows well. This is a patient from uh, New Zealand um, who also had a very nice long, prolonged response to crizotinib, but she became resistant. She actually underwent resection of a resistant lung specimen, so we actually had a fairly large piece of crizotinib resistant tumor tissue to work with. And uh, this patient did not have any ALK resistance mutations, but we act what we actually found instead was the presence of multiple different bypass mechanisms. So in this patient's spe specimen, she actually had two different histologic types in her resected lung specimen. One was a solid growth pattern that's shown on the far right column. And in that solid um, portion of her tumor, we saw high level uh, C-kit amplification that was confirmed by kit IHC. We also saw a high level expression of the ligand SCF. However, in the, a distinct part of the tumor, which had more of a BAC or bronchoalveolar pattern, we actually did not see C-kit amplification, and instead we saw a high-level phospho-EGFR -EG um, based on phospho-EGFR immunohistochemistry. So in this patient's tumor, even though it was one individual tumor, there were two histologically separate portions, and each of these histologically separate portions had a different active bypass mechanism. So this leads us to a pie chart. This is a very simplified view of crizotinib resistance and what we know about it to date. Um, there is a minority of patients, um, as Jeff showed, about a third of our patients where we find genetic alteration of ALK, primarily resistance mutations like 1196M, but also we do sometimes see amplification of the ALK fusion gene as well as a mechanism of resistance. <clears throat> 
And then in, in another, I would say in the remaining two-thirds of patients, the resistance mechanisms aren't entirely clear, although we believe that a substantial per proportion of those patients have bypass mechanisms, perhaps through EGFR or CKIT activation, that mediate crizotinib resistance. And when we first started looking at all of this, and this was probably now coming on four years that we've been studying this, we were thinking kind of in the most simplistic way that the more potent ALK inhibitors, like LDK and AP26113, which we'll hear about, would be most active in those patients who have acquired a genetic alteration in the target because those more potent ALK inhibitors might be able to overcome that type of alteration, whereas perhaps combination strategies would be needed for all the other types of resistance mechanisms outside of genetic alteration. So let's see if, if this actually holds up with the newest data. So these are the current um, next generation ALK inhibitors that are now in the clinic. There are seven of these, and all of these have been developed to more potently inhibit ALK. And many of these, as you can see, also do have very good ROS1 activity for the reasons that we talked about. The most advanced ALK inhibitors, next generation ALK inhibitors in the clinic are LDK378 from Novartis, Electinib um, from Chugai, now Roche, and uh, the Ariad compound 26113. So we'll talk about these three and the latest updates on their efficacy. Just to remind you, we had done a fair amount of work looking at those resistance mutations um, in the lab and trying to understand whether or not those resistance mutations made any difference clinically. And we actually, to be honest, still don't know, but preclinically in laboratory models, it does seem that those different resistance mutations do confer differing degrees of resistance to crizotinib and differing degrees of sensitivity to the next generation ALK inhibitor. So that's all that's meant to um, trying to show here. But again, clinically, as you'll see, this may actually not be as important as, as we were thinking. So let's start with LDK because LDK actually is the most advanced of the next generation ALK inhibitors in the clinic. Um, LDK is very potent, probably at least five to 10 times more potent than crizotinib against ALK. LDK does not have activity against CMET, but does have some activity against a few other kinases. I already mentioned ROS1, also IGF1R. And importantly, LDK378 does have activity against many of the known ALK resistance mutations, including the gatekeeper mutation. A fair amount of work had gone in, uh, into this compound, both at Novartis as well as here in Jeff's lab, looking at the activity of LDK378 in various resistance models. And this is just one example of a xenograft model with uh, ALK C1156Y mutation and showing that LDK378 was able to effectively overcome this resistance mutation in vivo. So we had actually, based on that phase one, um, sorry, based on that preclinical data, started this phase one study, which is a very straightforward phase one study with a dose escalation phase, um, followed by dose expansion at the MTD. Um, the MTD was established to be 750 milligrams per day, and then you can see each of our dose expansion cohorts, which really were focused on ALK-positive lung cancer that was resistant to crizotinib, ALK-positive lung cancer that was crizotinib-naive, and then all other non-lung ALK-positive cancers. So at the time of ASCO, when we presented this data, we had about 130 patients. And actually, I should say, this study is now closed at over 300 patients. So this is a huge phase one study. Um, but at the time of ASCO, we had 130 patients. And the majority of patients did have ALK-positive lung cancer. And among those patients, the majority, about 63%, were crizotinib resistant. So Jeff showed uh, a little bit of this waterfall plot in, in his talk. But this is the waterfall plot summarizing the activity of LDK378 in patients who received LDK at doses of 400 milligrams up to the MTD of 750 milligrams a day. And we basically broke down the patients by whether or not they had received crizotinib in the past or not. So the blue bars indicate patients who were primarily crizotinib resistant. We had a few that were crizotinib intolerant, but by and large, all the blue bars indicate crizotinib resistant patients, and you can see that almost all of them are responsive to this next generation ALK inhibitor. We also had some crizotinib naive patients as well in this study, as shown by the yellow bars, and again, they also were very sensitive to this next generation ALK inhibitor. Again, this is again just to highlight the types of responses. Many of these patients have these pretty dramatic responses, even to next generation ALK inhibitors, which I think was really not expected um, when we first went into this, because this is a TKI refractory population, and we really weren't expecting to see such rapid and dramatic responses, but we did, and this is an example of one, and this patient maintained her response for about 15 months. 
I think the other very, very important thing that we've now seen with all of the next generation ALK inhibitors, not just LDK, which this slide illustrates, um, is that there is very good activity of these next generation ALK inhibitor inhibitors in the brain. So this is a patient of ours who at the time of enrollment onto LDK was found to have multiple new brain metastases. He was not symptomatic, and this study actually did allow you to enroll as long as you were not symptomatic. He did not receive any radiation treatment, and instead he just went on to LDK-378. And you can see even after just six weeks of LDK, he already had responses in his brain lesions. They were smaller, and he had resolution of the edema. And this patient actually has continued on study today at over 10 months, not requiring any radiation therapy for his CNS disease, which is actually quite remarkable. And this is not just a single patient. This is true for, actually, I would say the majority of patients who have enrolled on LDK with untreated asymptomatic brain metastases. So this data shows you that these responses are not transient. These are actually quite durable responses. And again, this is at the time of ASCO that we saw that the median progression-free survival with LDK in all of our patients who had received LDK from dos at doses of 400 milligrams and higher was 8.6 months, actually quite similar to what we see with crizotinib in a crizotinib-naive population. And the duration of response in those patients with, res with confirmed responses was also, as expected, quite high at 8.2 months. In the crizotinib-resistant cohort, we saw very similar data where the median progression-free survival was 8.3 months. This is data that Jeff was referring to, and actually this is all done um, with uh, Ryohei Kariyama and Luke Fribolo um, in Jeff's lab, looking at patients at the time they enrolled onto LDK and doing a biopsy of their crizotinib-resistant tumors, and now looking at their mutation status and correlating that with their responsiveness to LDK. So their mutation, the patient's mutation status is shown above each of the bars. NM stands for no mutation or amplification. And then those patients that had specific resistance mutations are shown here. There were five with resistance mutations and two with amplification of the ALK fusion gene. And what you can see from here is that all of our patients, um, regardless of whether or not they have an ALK resistance mutation or gene amplification, are very, very sensitive to LDK378. So the, the underlying resistance mechanism does not seem uh, to matter in terms of sensitivity to LDK378, and this gets to Jeff's point about whether or not all of these tumors are just, um, there's a sub-therapeutic inhibition of ALK by crizotinib, and hence all of them are still reliant on ALK and hence responsive to these next generation ALK inhibitors. So here's some data on electinib, and this is actually um, just presented last month and is about to be updated at the World Lung Cancer Conference. This is electinib, um, which used to be called uh, CH5420802. Um, this is a compound that Chugai developed and that Roche has now licensed and is developing in ALK-positive lung cancer. This is also a very uh, potent and actually even more selective ALK inhibitor perhaps than LDK. It does not inhibit ROS1. It had excellent preclinical data showing that it was active in ALK-positive lung cancer, both crizotinib-naive as well as crizotinib-resistant. This is data that actually um, uh, Chuga presented uh, at ASCO this year showing the activity of electinib in the crizotinib naive patient population in Japan, so a very homogeneous patient population, and it had a very remarkable response rate of over, over 93%, so almost every patient in Japan with ALK positive lung cancer who had never seen crizotinib had a response, a PR or CR, um, to electinib. So very, very active compound. These were very prolonged responses at the time of ASCO. The majority of patients were still on study, and this is actually after over 12 months of treatment. So now what about electinib and crizotinib resistant patients? Well, this is their data so far um, with electinib and crizotinib resistance. And again, it's looking very similar to what we've seen with LDK, a response rate in the 50 to 60% range in crizotinib resistance, and also durations of study that seem to be quite respectable as well. Very similarly, the ARIAD compound, AP26113, has um, shown very good activity. This is some of the preclinical data that ARIAD has presented at ASCO as well as at ESMO um, last month showing uh, the activity in vitro of the different ALK inhibitors, next generation ALK inhibitors against different resistance mutations, showing that their ARIAD compound is able to overcome many of the known resistance mutations. And again, very similar to what we just saw with LDK and with electinib, very good activity of this ARIAD compound in patients with crizotinib resistance. Here, the response rate was 65%. So here's a table comparing now these three um, ALK inhibitors, LDK, the electinib compound, and ARIAD, the ARIAD compounds. Um, and I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. 
you can see that the response rate across all three of these drugs is quite similar, between 50 and 60 percent. However, I would note that the LDK378 response rate of 57 percent is a confirmed response rate. Um, actually, when we first presented the LDK data and we included confirmed and unconfirmed responses, it was actually 80 percent, so the confirmation does bring it down a little bit. The Chugai Roche compound as well as the Arid compound have unconfirmed response rates in the 50 to 60 percent range. They'll probably all be pretty similar. We only have PFS data for the LDK compound, as I mentioned, that's pretty impressive with a PFS in the crizotinib resistant population of 8.3 months. All three drugs have shown very, very good CNS activity, and so many of, um, many of these uh, compounds will almost certainly have uh, a role in treating patients with um, refractory uh, CNS metastases after crizotinib. And then I wanted to highlight a couple distinguishing features of these ALK inhibitors. So with LDK378, I didn't show you the whole adverse event table, but certainly there are a number of adverse events with LDK, primarily GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which we see in over 50% of patients. It's primarily grade one or grade two. However, we have had some more significant um, GI side effects. And so many patients do require a dose reduction of LDK from the MTD of 750 um, to 600 or below. And I should say once they're dose reduced, patients actually do remarkably well on, on that um, dose. The Roche compound appears to be quite well tolerated, although I would note that they have not pushed to the MTD, and they presented this at ESMO last month where they show the different doses and the different toxicities that were seen at the different doses, and for various reasons, they've decided to settle at a dose um, going forward of 600 milligrams twice a day, which is really not the MTD. They could, probably could have actually almost certainly pushed to 760 where they did not see any DLTs, and they could even possibly have pushed above that. So that could be one limitation with the Roche compound, that they're actually not at MTD. And then finally, the Aerate compound also appears to be well tolerated. We have patients on that drug who are doing very, very well. However, there is an interesting observation that we've made on this study that 10 to 15 percent of patients have an early pulmonary toxicity, where, where within the first 24 hours, so they've gotten only a single dose of the Aerate compound, we see dyspnea, hypoxia, sometimes cough, um, and this has been uh, I would say somewhat severe in some patients and somewhat mild in others, and it's very hard to predict who is at risk for this toxicity. So this could potentially be a limitation for developing the Ariad compound as well. So now this brings us back to our simplified pie chart, and the only thing I wanted to highlight here is this idea that in addition to all the genetic mechanisms of resistance, which we've been very interested in, there does seem to be a component of resistance that has to do with pharmacokinetic, possibly pharmacodynamic issues related to crizotinib, where there may be over time um, sub-therapeutic inhibition of the, of the target, which is why we see such good activity of the next generation ALK inhibitors across all of our patients. And then I'm just going to end on this, which is to highlight some of the combination strategies, strategies we've been thinking about, because of course, as we said, monotherapies are not the best long-term solution, although they are, have been very good in the short term, but we definitely need better, more durable um, strategies, and certainly combinations may be uh, a part of that. So some of the combinations that are being investigated are shown here, and I would say uh, probably the most promising combinations will utilize the next generation ALK inhibitors, so the most potent ALK inhibitors we have with another, with another uh, drug. For example, maybe EGFR inhibitors, since we do see a lot of EGFR activation in patients with crizotinib resistance, or maybe we'd want to take a slightly broader approach and look at the uh, next generation ALK inhibitors with HSP90 inhibitors, which do inhibit a number of different um, important uh, growth promoters in the cell. So there are some studies, for example, LDK with an HSP90 inhibitor like AUI that's specifically looking at overcoming resistance in crizotinib and LDK resistant patients. So to summarize, um, we know that there are many different mechanisms of resistance to crizotinib and that you can see multiple different mechanisms of resistance even in a single patient. The next generation ALK inhibitors are uniformly active in crizotinib resistance, and this appears to be regardless of the presence of a resistance mutation. As I mentioned, a large component of crizotinib resistance does appear to be related to pharmacokinetic and possibly pharmacodynamic factors. And I do believe that next generation ALK inhibitors will become a standard therapy for crizotinib resistant ALK positive lung cancer. Both LDK as well as electinib now have FDA breakthrough therapy status, um, and so will likely be, LDK in particular, will likely be approved in the next six months or so. And I think the main question is when do we move these, ALK these next generation ALK inhibitors up? And we, I think that's sort of the, a big question is whether or not patients sh should all start with the most potent ALK inhibitor.
And we definitely still need strategies to overcome resistance even to our best next generation ALK inhibitors. We have patients relapsing on these next generation ALK inhibitors even in the CNS despite the good CNS activity of these drugs. And so just to uh, I think what your appetite a little bit about a new, what I'm calling a third generation ALK ROS1 inhibitor. We have a compound from Pfizer. Pfizer's developed this very, very potent ALK ROS1 inhibitor, 646-3922. They presented this data at last week's um, AACR triple meeting. Um, and this inhibitor has actually been um, very carefully designed both to be very potent against ALK and ROS1, to inhibit many of the known resistance mutations, and to not be a substrate for some of the drug efflux pumps like p glycoprotein. And in fact, this drug does actually seem to have very good CNS penetration. And this is just some in vitro data that Pfizer presented showing the activity of this drug in a, a, a xenograft model um, of, a, of CNS disease. And so we're very excited to get this trial open. It's actually approved um, here at our site. Um, and we'll have specific cohorts for patients who have refractory CNS disease, either brain metastases or leptomeningeal disease. So I definitely would keep an eye out on this third generation inhibitor. So I'll just close by thanking everyone who has been involved in our resistance studies in particular. Um, in the lab, certainly um, big thanks to Jeff Engelman and many of the postdocs in his lab who have worked on this, on this resistance project with us. We also have a very extensive network of collaborators um, around the world who have also contributed patients and patient uh, tumor samples for us to study to identify resistance mechanisms. Thanks very much. Before we take questions, I'd just like to make a couple comments about the importance of these studies. There are two things that are just remarkable about uh, these phase one studies. First, when I, I entered the field 40 years ago, I was told that uh, in phase one, you don't pay any attention to responses because they're rare, they're rare and that that's not an important part of the, the whole thing. Obviously, that's no longer true. The second is how these studies have changed the whole pathway to drug approval. I mean, it's really conceivable that the phase one studies become the basis for an application for accelerated approval, as, as happened with, with uh, crizotinib and undoubtedly with these other drugs. So uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. I, I, Joe. Are, are these uh, second, gen, second generation drugs uh, even more potent against MET? No, in fact, um, I don't believe any of them hit MET. They hit ROS, um, that table summarized which ones hit, they almost all hit ROS, but they don't actually have activity against MET. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's good. <laughs> maybe it's good. Do, do you think there are a lot more uh, translocated tyrosine kinases in lung cancer and cancer in general that are yet to be discovered, or do you think we've kind of plateaued or we're at the beginning or kind of at the end of identifying those? So um, there almost certainly are other tyrosine kinase gene rearrangements um, in not just lung cancer, but other, I would say all cancer types, but they probably are somewhat rare. Um, we have seen recently a new uh, kinase gene rearrangement in lung cancer that involves TRAC1 and TRAC1. Um, or what used to be called track A, and it's found probably in less than 1% of our patients. And I think over time, with all the um, next generation sequencing efforts, we are going to see a little trickle in of these rare types of rearrangements that may actually predict for sensitivity to certain um, targeted therapies, but I think there won't be some huge EGFR size subset um, of, of, of a gene rearrangement. Lou. No. Yeah, I mean, the genomic analysis suggests that we would have to have looked at about 10,000 patients to saturate the number of um, recurrent driver mutations in lung adeno at, for, that occur in 1% or more of patients. So we're well short of that. Um, is there anything special about the downstream signaling from ALK and ROS in that they're so highly related in the kinome tree? Why those two chosen by do they play a special role in lung biology normally? You know, actually, ALK is really not expressed at all in the lung. In fact, that's why the diagnostic assay um, using immunohistochemistry works so well. So there's no ALK in the lung. Um, ALK really, its role is primarily uh, restricted to the development of the central nervous system, at least in, in mouse modeling. And there's no known role of ALK outside of the, outside of the nervous system. So I, I would say that's not clear. Telling us something. There must be some downstream targets that are 
Alice, uh, is much known about the new drugs, the second generation drugs in the non-lung ALK mutated tumors? Yeah, so the LDK phase one study did allow patients to enroll who had non-lung ALK positive cancers. We have had anaplastic large cell lymphomas um, that were uh, ALK rearranged uh, go on to LDK and have beautiful responses, just like they do to crizotinib. We have had some inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors go on to uh, LDK as well. They have ALK rearrangements, and they've also responded. I think one of the interesting uh, cohorts of patients were, the, were the, those that have inflammatory breast cancer and were felt to have ALK overexpression. Um, this has been recently described, um, recently reported in the literature. And so we actually had four patients with so-called ALK overexpressed or, um, inflammatory breast cancer, and none of them responded, suggesting that ALK really probably is not a driver in those types of breast cancer. Okay, one more question. If not, we'll br let's break, and, and you can ask Alice, Gleesha, and Jeff uh, any remaining questions. Thank you so much.